Hello, and welcome back to Following Note on a Stormlight podcast. This week, we are on episode 36, where we will be discussing chapters 45 through 49 uh, in part three. How are y'all doing today, men? How are you doing, Trevor? I'm doing well. Thanks. Thanks for asking. Thanks for doing the intro. Shaking it up a bit. How are you, My Paul? My pleasure. I'm doing great. It's It's been a good week. It's been a real good week. How about you, Elliot? I'm good. I'm good. I feel like you're stealing there, Trevor. You better watch out there. <laughs> exactly. That's I'm I'm gunning for your job right now. So <laughs> You're doing great. I'm not concerned. <laughs> Thank, you. Thank you so much. All right. So getting into this, um I did the intro mostly just to avoid doing two words. So <laughs> what are your two words this week? My two words for chapters forty five through forty nine were camaraderie and justice. Okay. Camaraderie and justice. Okay. What about you, Trevor? So my words are in tandem with each other, and it is quiet conversations. Okay. So we have quiet conversations and camaraderie and justice. Did, did I get one of those wrong? Okay. Nope. That was it. Cool. All right. Well, I'm looking forward to diving into this. It's going to be a good week. All right, all right. Camaraderie and justice. Uh, do you mind explaining a little bit of what you meant with those, Elliot? I would love to. So camaraderie, I picked that one to try and kind of group together the camaraderie that Kaladin and, and his Bridge Four pals are feeling as they go out drinking. I thought that that was actually a great little scene just to kind of build up some of that you know, togetherness that they have. And, Kaladin is even noticing that some of the other bridges, they, they don't have that yet. They don't have that, you know, I've got your back, you're my buddy kind of thing. But but Bridge 4 really does. And so to see Kaladin get in on that, it was pretty cool. But then also I, I'm stretching camaraderie to Shallan and her family in the, the scenes. We get some really touching scenes here of Shallan trying to build her family back up. She really is is working so hard to like, reach out to her brothers and try and lift them back up from this dark place that they're at and, and building maybe some, some camaraderie, some family ness back together there. So, so cool stuff there. And then I picked justice for a couple of reasons. First off for the discussion that Kaladin has with Moash's friends, the assassin people, there are assassins all over Roshar. That, that, that has my, been my takeaway so far of, of Words of Radiance, really, is watch your back, because there are assassins everywhere. Uh, but and it, their discussion and Kaladin's kind of mental struggle of, you know, what is justice here? Does does Elokar deserve to be, you know, assassinated? Is Did, did Moash, is there been an injustice done here in his kind of wrestling um, there and figuring out? And then also justice for Shalon's brother Jushu and or Yushu Jushu Jushu it's a it's a hard J Jushu it is okay. a hard J I just thought about that that is that is a little different from some of the other names we've seen but but the whole dilemma of, of him of you know is he spared from maybe a rightful justice of getting dragged away for his gambling crimes and and Shalon and her brothers you know reaching out to save him and, and sparing him so too many words we'll talk about it all as we get there but camaraderie and justice Perfect, perfect. And uh, I'm also going to pass the baton back off to you, Trevor, with quiet conversations. I'm curious to hear about your two words. Uh, sure. There, if you don't mind explaining. So this is actually an interesting episode for you to hand uh, the two-word summary that we do off to me because Chapter 45 has really special place in my in my heart for Words of Radiance. I really enjoy Chapter 45 specifically but i picked quiet conversations not only for 45 but there's a lot of quiet conversations between a couple different a couple different characters throughout these chapters 45 through 49 we have schlon and the messenger in 45 we have kaladin and shen having an interesting heart to heart kaladin and graves 
are having a quiet conversation in the back of a tavern. Shalon and Pattern are trying to figure out where your theory is. Shalon and Jushu are really bonding for the first time we've seen on page after she saves him, which we'll talk about more in a little bit. And Adolin and Shalon are having their first genuine conversation. They're on a date. They're watching a high storm because that's that's apparently what you do on on Roshar, and they we've had some very very touching and very endearing quiet conversations this this episode. Great point. We do not have a spell check. We didn't really meet anybody new. I do want to talk about Kaladin's chapter first, though, and then we'll kind of tackle Shalon. Uh, Shalon past, Shalon present, all all kind of at once. We have one Kaladin chapter. That's chapter forty six. Do either of you want to pick this up to start? Yeah. So the first thing I I really picked up on on this chapter, or the first part that really made me made me think, is the bit we get where Kaladin to go ahead and trust Shen, the, the parchment that's been a part of their bridge four for a while now. And he gives him this spear almost as like a ceremonial, you know, you're officially part of bridge four. Now here's your spear. We trust you with this. And I think that's, I, I guess a cool move for Kalan. I think that's honorable to, to bring him in and realize, you know, Hey, we, we can't be all about, you know, everyone getting a, a fair chance and yet not give you a, a fair chance just because your skin is a, is a different color. And I think he even kind of says something, along those lines but all of that to say we know a lot more than kaladin does about what parchment potentially are and so this could maybe be dangerous is is shen the same as the parshendi is he a void bringer is he a spy for the parsh things we don't know yet and then it even kind of leaves off on an ominous note where kaladin and shen are talking and shen tries to tell him something Interrupted, and he never gets a chance to. So now I'm stuck wondering, what was Shen going to try and tell Kaladin? Because I feel like that was going to be important. And yeah, so I'm not sure what to think about that. But interesting development for Bridge Four. Agreed. I actually really liked this chapter. I'm really glad that they came back to this Shen getting a spear moment because it happened before where Shen was kind of like. I'm bridge for slave because mm -hmm. yep. you know, he's a parchment and he didn't really get to do all the same things. Couldn't quite do all the same things. And it was honestly kind of sad. Um, I wanted this to happen, but I also understood there's so many like social and Im other implications that go with this. Um, number one being if people see a parch parchment carrying a spear, they can start asking questions. They're already having questions probably about our our dark guy's captain. Is that what he is? Is that mm -hmm. what Caledon is? Yeah. Um and so kind of a lot of stuff there. And I one thing I want to highlight. So I guess Caledon went to Dalinar with this, asking, What do you think I should do? Um and Dalinar was just like, Well, do you trust him? I believe that was the question. Um, or do you think this is the right decision pretty much? And I guess Calvin thought about it and was like, yeah. And I kind of liked how simple that was. Um, Delano wasn't like, oh, well, like if we do that, then this is going to happen. All this stuff, you know, he kind of, it's, it's another example of how little Delano cares about like the social norms or political things going on. Sure. Um, uh, and stuff and i th there's obviously the risk or the the looming threat of the void bringers but i'm not too worried about it if it's just one of them i mean i guess he could go berserk and kill some people which would not be ideal but um I i'm not too afraid i i think this was kind of a touching moment even though i don't think it would make that big of a difference I don't know. I'm just really glad that they came back to this and kind of gave us a little bit of closure on that. Um, While we're on the like, topic of 
Parshman and Parshendi. I do want to bring up something here. If Shen is a spy for the Parshendi, if you want to call it that, and if the Parshman form is just, if they're the same race as the Parshendi, they're just in a different form, and Shen has the potential of storm form, I want you guys to remember back to Eshenai's chapter that there was a very specific event that happened to Eshenai's mind and that it suppressed the rational side of her mind. So if that were to happen to Shen, we might have a problem. That is true. And I feel like my only thought with that is, I don't know how big of a difference that spear would make. I feel like if it's in storm form, you have bigger predicaments at hand if if it seems in the storm form not like ah oh, like if he only didn't have that spear we would have all been fine you know right i feel like uh it won't be that big of a deal so i was very happy with this but um, on the other hand if push comes to shove and shen starts rebelling or whatever that would would look like he could remember that no kaladin treated me fairly even though nobody else did so maybe that maybe it's a good thing so who knows mm -hmm. that's what i was leaning towards that's what i'm hoping for i do think one, one one thought i had about this specifically this is like a worst case scenario this would be a big tragedy and it's if let's say shen betrays and he kills someone really important to kaladin then that really hurts his view of his holistic group of bridge four. Obviously Shen has been an outlier because he is a Parshman, but he's always had this like no man, no man left behind mentality. Right. Um, and I feel like that kind of burst his bubble with that. Um, if he was betrayed. So I don't want to see it, but I'm kind of afraid that would happen. Like Shen would just in his own conscious mind, like, I don't know, kill another bridgeman or something. I'm I'm, I'm guessing, it. if I were to guess, I, I would guess that the story is going in the direction of Shallan at some point is going to try and convince everyone that the Parshmen are Voidbringers and they need to be, you know, not trusted, distance, all of that. And Callan's going to be stuck with this, you know, tough moral decision of, hey, Shen's been a really loyal member of Bridge Four, and now I'm being told he's a Voidbringer and I can't trust him. You know, what does he do? That's that's. I'm, I'm guessing we're going, we're heading towards that moral dilemma for for Callan, and, and we'll see if he has to make that decision or not. That'd be my guess. It just dawned on me that Shen isn't on my uh, Bridge Four poster. Ooh. Uh -oh. I don't know how I haven't thought of that yet, but <laughs> interesting. Anyway, so yeah, interesting stuff about Shen there to start the, the chapter off before Kaladin goes off drinking with the crew. Which I do want to bring up because as far as technicality goes, Kaladin is breaking the rules here. The There is an Alethi, Alethi code of war that we got shoved down our throat all of the way of kings by Dalinar, who was insistent that all of his officers, and he wanted all the rest of the high princes, but he doesn't actually have the authority to enforce that, to follow these Alethi codes of war. And that what well, one of them that Adolin follows is that you will, you will not be drunk ever. You're not allowed to ever get drunk. And so Kaladin going out drinking with his, his men, that's actually breaking that. And Kaladin is an officer there's an asterisk there because he's kind of outside the chain of command as we as as they explored a little bit at the end of the way of kings when kaladin got this position so maybe there's maybe there's a little bit more to that but kaladin's breaking the rules here there there might be another kind of gray line there and that does Kaladin actually get drunk here or is he just, you know, a few, like it's hard to tell. Maybe we don't have enough, enough description of what's going on here to, to see, but 
but yeah, I, I didn't think about that actually when I when I was reading through this that this could yeah be be a violation of the codes that Dalinar is such a big proponent of this. I was actually thinking of this in a in a pretty positive light, just the fact that he's going out and and with his team. But yeah, th- this Kaladin might need to be a little careful here. May, maybe Kaladin doesn't even know about those those codes, but maybe he needs to be a little more aware of his responsibilities of an office as an officer here. You're, you're certainly supposed to think of it in a a, a lighter tone as a, more than Kaladin breaking the rules. He is supposed to be communing with his his friends and his men, and you're supposed to be encouraged by that. But just a, just a side note there. I think this did a great job of showing that community. One thing I briefly wanted to touch on, I just thought it was funny about the... What was it, the... The horn eater lager, is yeah. that what it was? And they're like, sorry, we don't serve that. It melts our cups. And they made like three <laughs> different points about it. Like it it, rots, it it destroys your teeth and stuff like that. And Rock was always so upset about it. Yeah. Drinking this woman's drink, which was their strong ale or whatever. Right. Um, but past that, I thought it was really cool learning more about Rock's homeland and yeah. history and things like that. I was actually really interested in that since he can see Spren and we don't really know why um I guess until this chapter it's kind of revealed but maybe not 100% um so we learned that I guess as people have a lot of history with Spren and they were guided up there it was hard for me to tell what was like a, a folk tale and what was true history because right since we kept making these logical points and Ronk was like, no, 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 you're all wrong. Hush, hush. Air- it's a good day. Air-sick it's a good day. <laughs> yeah. Airsick Lowlander. The thick air make your head dumb. I don't know. <laughs> 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 and stuff. And uh, so it was kind of hard to tell, but I mean, either way, Ronk can see spread. I don't know. I was kind of curious to hear what Elliot thought about this. Because, yeah, I didn't know where the line was between truth and folklore i i too wasn't sure what to take as fact and what was you know drunken embellishment on on rock's part you know whether he's just having fun here or, or whether he's telling some of the truth but i i noted a couple of things that i thought were, were pretty interesting the, the the whole idea that they have these hot springs at the top of their mountains that provide warmth for them to you know live in a, for their for their culture i think that's a really cool um idea i I was kind of, I was very curious about like his description of those waters and how like when you swim in them as a horn eater you commune with the the gods which it whenever rock says gods I'm kind of interpreting that as spren and so yeah it's they kind of are questioning him like oh so you can see spren because you swam in the waters but he like won't answer rock won't answer that question as to whether that's true or not yeah this is a, this is another shout out to Michael Kramer's performance in this scene because when Kaladin presses him, he's like, Oh, so that's why you can see Spren. His voice turns back to rock. He's like, it's not part of story. And then Kaladin's like, wait, no, th- th- that's why you can see Spren. He's like, it's not part of story. And like, that's, he goes into this really funny voice for me. It's, I, I really enjoy his performance there. I do want to read a little bit about, of this passage. Um, because there is an Easter egg which I don't know if you guys spotted, and it's not a spoiler if, if I talk about it, but it it requires a very close close read, so I will read it and see if you guys can pick up on what I'm trying to uh, guide you towards. Now they're just hot springs. No, they're just hot springs, Sigzel grumbled, but returned to his drink. Rock rolled his eyes. On top is water. Beneath is not. Is something else. Water of life. The place of gods. This thing is true. I have met a god myself. A god like Sill? Kaladin asked. Or maybe a river spren? No, Rock said. He leaned in as if saying something conspiratorial. I saw Lunu Anakai. Lunu Anakai, Rock said, is god of travel and mischief. Very powerful god. He came from depths of peak ocean. From realm of gods. 
What did he look like? Lopin asked. Like person, Rock said. Maybe Alethi, though, though skin was lighter. Very angular face. Handsome, perhaps, with white hair. Sigsa looked up sharply. White hair? Yes, Rock said. Not gray, like old man, but white. Yet he is young man. He spoke with me on shore. Ha! Made mockery of my beard. Asked what year it was by Horn Eater calendar. Thought my name was funny. Very powerful god. Lopin hurriedly drank the rest of his mu first mug. Sigsa looked troubled, and had only touched half of his drink. He stared at it, though when Moash asked him what it was wrong, Sigdal made an excuse about being tired. I think... Oh. Go ahead. Is there more? No, nope, that's it. <laughs> okay. I think I know. And I, I feel like the most... The first thing that pops in my head is wit. Okay. For sure. Because wit was described at the beginning. I don't remember anything about white hair, but I remember him being unique. Like, not exactly like a Lethe or like anyone else. But, I mean, he's not like a crazy looking monster or anything. I mean, he's like a normal person, just a little different than everyone else. Um, and that seems like the description there, as well as the mischief, travel, and you know, making fun of his beard, all this stuff. It's definitely reminiscent of wit. Um, so that that's my definite first thought. Also with Sigzel, because there's, there's a connection between Sigzel and wit, right? Yep. I forget what it is. He was like his apprentice. He's apprentice, or, yep. Some, okay. Yeah. So I'm assuming that's with the the coyness there with, with Sigzel was about as well elliot paul's thinking the same things that the white hair is throwing me just because wit is described as having black hair which is going to be important here in a minute it is going to be the, important here in a minute the the white hair has me completely thrown so i don't know i i, I could tell this was important of some sort but i chalked it off as i don't have enough knowledge to know why yet sounds like you may be about to tell me otherwise i my it's... only thought right quick about the white hair is so this was rock seeing the spren right like the god supposedly um, so my only guess or my only possible solution to the white hair black hair thing is hoid is like a spren or something. He's a god, something like He's that, something. where he has a form in the cognitive realm. Um, and this is that form in the cognitive realm. Okay. Which could still be similar to how he looks or, you know, unique. Just has white hair and a more angular face or something, you know. Um, that's my only guess. So, you guys are on the right track. Wit has actually been described as having both so far of having dark hair as we met him out on the the shattered plains and kaladin's wander sail chapter he's also been described as having light hair in the alethi court when he's sitting on the islands in and making fun of people as they come into the to elicar's feast he's actually described as having white hair so he so he's been described as both and then the the fact that sigzel uh, freaks out at the at the description. So just rock, rock and rock and Hoyd have had a running in. Interesting. That I'll, Hoyd guy keeps showing up. I'll, I'll keep this out. We're gonna need it in a second. He does keep showing up, doesn't he? All right. So move, moving on from that little little Easter egg, I I get very excited whenever I. I, I see Hoyd show up, and even in, even in passing, in a <laughs> drunken horn eater tale. Anyway, moving through this chapter, Moash and Kaladin have a meeting with Moash's friends. I guess we'll call them for now. And before we get there, Sill has a very interesting reaction to this. Did you guys pick up on this? I, I did notice that she 
she warns Kaladin, like as he's walking into the room, she says something like "Be careful" or, or something along those those lines. I guess I didn't think too much of it, just as you know, Sil Sil tends to be a little bit cautious to begin with, so she. I just kind of took it as she's picking up on some potential danger here and just kind of giving Kaladin a keep your wits about you kind of thing. But what I wanted to, to highlight is Syl disappears from Kaladin's vision. Oh yeah. And Kaladin thinks about that for a second as he's walking through. It's like, has she done that before? So I didn't know that was a thing she could do. So he doesn't, he doesn't see her around, but he hears her. So she's definitely there, but she disappears. So her there's something interesting going on there. Just wanted to to bring that up. Moving into awesome. this moving into this meeting though. What do you guys think of Graves? And just on a, on a side note, as a first time reader, I kept getting Graves and Marais mixed up, like and combined in my head as the same person. They are not the same person, two completely different people. So Graves is because they're both like kind of shadowy figures working behind the scenes in the in the war camps. Two completely different people. So Graves is after Elokar. Marais, as far as we know, is after Amaram. So just wanted to get that get that straight before we moved into this. One of my first thoughts about Graves was or this whole situation. I was a little upset. Because I still had, I still believed that Moesh had a shard blade. And yeah. it was gonna be a major reveal. If like just kinda crumpled that up and threw it out. So we we've learned that unexpected people have shard blades, so I would keep that crumpled up paper, you know, somewhere close by maybe and not quite throw it out. True. I I was like ninety percent expecting to be the ghost bloods and so as 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 the book is describing this scene of of kaladin walking into this, this group i'm looking for any kind of parallels i can tie back to the group of ghost bloods that shallan met with you know any character that i can say oh yeah that was the same person but i didn't see that i didn't see anything to hint that these are the the ghost bloods which was a little bit surprising to me so i'm i definitely can't say for sure ghost bloods or even a group that maybe the ghost bloods are using or whatnot but it doesn't seem to be blatantly you know an official arm of of the ghost bloods that are here trying to assassinate elokar hard to tell though right i want to i want to highlight graves's approach here he's very much trying to approach kaladin as his friend and Marais last week was not doing that with Shallan. Marais was very was approaching the the meaning from a position of power. It's like I I could kill you any second I wanted with this blow dart. That's how that's how the meeting starts. Uh, Graves introduces himself and says, "Hey, come have it. Come sit down. Come have a drink, and we'll we'll, we'll chat." Kaladin doesn't want anything to do with it. He's just like, "Why are you trying to kill Elokar?" And Graves is like, "Whoa." Uh, well, we'll get there, and he tries to sweet talk him a little bit, but Graves is very tactful, and he knows his audience. Moash has obviously told Graves about Kaladin because of the specific wordage he uses here. Graves talks about be the surgeon this kingdom needs, and that that resonates with Kaladin a little bit too much for Kaladin's liking. He he walks out of like we'll, we'll go back to the meeting in a second, but he walks out of the the meeting and he's thinking about those words. He's like, "Gosh, dang it. Why did he have to say that?" Because I can totally understand his point of view of of Elokar and being the weak link in in uh in Alethkar. So, Graves is really smart with how he he approaches Kaladin with this he he's not only smart he's he's really honest or at least he comes across that way he seems to like truly believe in his cause he he's you know trying he's, he's convincing Kaladin or trying to convince him but he's doing it in a very 
effective way. It, it's not like you compare him to Moraes where he's, you know, threatening Khaled to do this or trying to manipulate Khaled. And he's just kind of straight up telling it like, like he sees it, you know, Hey, I think Elokar is a terrible King. Here's some pretty good reasons why I think he's a terrible King. I think Dalinar would be a better King. So I'm going to kill Elokar. So Dalinar will be King. Like it's all very logical. It's all very, like it, it makes sense. You're not looking at this guy thinking, oh, he's a dirty underhanded manipulator. It's like, no, this guy's more of just like a, a zealot who's has a rather crazy cause that he believes in a lot. I mean, it's, I, I'm kind of with Kaladin that like, y- you kind of don't want to fault the guy. You, you kind of want to say, yeah, I mean, you admire someone for going after their passion, but then you, you think about what it is they're talking about, assassinating the King. And like, hold on a second. There's gotta be better w- problems than just, you know, going around assassinating folks. So I, th- they have put, Kaladin in a in a sticky place, I think. I think Kaladin is going to consider their proposition way more because of the way Graves a- approaches it. That I think you're right. Kaladin walking into this meeting was just going to see who it was and leave and get information about who's trying to kill Elkar. But because of the way Graves presents it to him, he's second guessing himself about does Elokar actually deserve to be king, and that he's he's giving it more thought than he should as the head of his guard. And, and this was partly why I picked justice for one of my words, and that you know Kaladin's dilemma now is okay for Kaladin to take justice into his own hands. Is it okay for Kaladin to decide Elokar is not worthy to rule? I'm going to remove him or allow him to be removed. Or is that not Kaladin's place? Is that not okay for him to be the deciding hand of of justice? I think that's now the decision he's going to have to make. But I think we talked about this last episode a little bit and that he didn't immediately go and turn in Moash he kind of you know, said, you know, oh, you're you're one of Bridge Four. I'll, I'll I'll give you some slack here for a little bit. We'll see what happens. Well, now he's had this meeting, and and the ball is in Kaladin's court now. So that there's no more like standing back and waiting to see what happens. Kaladin's gonna have to make a decision here. Does he? What does he tell these people? Does he give them an answer? Does he go and turn them all in to Dalinar? Like Kaladin's gonna have to take some action here now. Uh, Paul, what are your honest thoughts on Elokar? On Elokar? I don't think he deserves to be assassinated. That's kind of been his whole shtick throughout the whole book, I feel like. Everything we've read so far, not just this book. Mm -hmm. Um, Getting assassinated, his paranoia of it. Um, He's kind of a... He's definitely portrayed as a big idiot. He kind of lives up to it, but... They are a little harsh to him, but I mean, it's kind of rightfully so. I don't like him. But he's still, like, pretty important. Now that I say that, I don't know fully how important he is. I I actually think the importance of his character is this. It's Dalinar is basically vowed to protect him because he's so distraught about Gavilar still, and he's still torn up about what happened. That this is kind of his character to almost care for or protect, kind of like a semblance or memory of Gavilar. Um, and I feel like that gives Dalinar a whole lot of purpose. And I feel like without that, Dalinar still, like, let's say Elikar gets assassinated and dies, Dalinar is still going to be Dalinar and I think keep doing what he's doing. But that would hurt him a lot. Like, he would be very devastated with that. More than anyone else, I would wager. Him and Navani, I guess. Um, so, yeah, I think his purpose, to call it, is a little more abstract, almost. He himself isn't a great character. But what he does for Dalinar is kind of unique, and I like that. Sure. 
If you think back all the way to the chapter where we met Dalinar, Dalinar, Sadius, and Elokar are all on a chasm fiend hunt on the Shattered Plains. And Dalinar's motivation to go save Elokar and kind of how kind of our introduction to Dalinar is my brother died. I have two things left of him, his kingdom and his son. And I'm going to defend both until I die because I failed to uh, protect my, my brother. So even, even if Dalinar could be convinced that he would be a better King than Elokar, there's no way that he would, that he would want that over, over Elokar. Any other thoughts on this chapter? Don't think so. Okay. Backing up to chapter 45, we have... So this this chapter is very interesting to me because it used to be one of my least favorite chapters until like my fourth read of the book. And it dawned on me who is in this chapter, and it instantly became one of my favorites. So we won't get there quite yet because that's the that's that last like quarter of the chapter. But this this chapter is titled Middle Fest, and it's a Shalon flashback chapter, and it's Shalon. She's kind of frantically running around this festival trying to make her family feel better whether that be Balat and talking with him about elita his his female girlfriend whatever you want to call her or wakim and getting him interested in a hobby of tracking high storms or her father trying to distract him from whatever debt he's he's having trouble with at the moment she's just trying to run around and keep her family happy and it isn't till the end of the chapter that we get to our our special scene but what were your guys's thoughts on the on the middle fest chapter i i too appreciated that that shalon is working really hard to try and help her her brothers especially i mean somewhat for her father but it, it kind of seems like through these chapters that we see here, she might be starting to see him more of, of a loss as a lost cause, but like her brothers, you know, she goes all the way to write letters to, to this other girl from a different province to, to, to try and build up this relationship for Balat. And then it's mentioned when she's talking with Wakim in the, in the carriage that she spent weeks translating those math equations so that he could, you know, have something in glyphs that he could read and solve and how, even though initially he's kind of, you know, why, why did you go through that trouble? That was a waste of time. And shortly after he's, you know, like gleefully pouring over there, over them and getting some, some happiness where maybe he hasn't had some for weeks. So Shalon is, is trying really hard here. And I, I think this is, it, it's a heartwarming little moment for me. A lot of the, a lot of the Shalon flashback chapters have been really dark. We, we've seen her family in a lot of broken places and to see her, you know, starting to repair some of that brokenness is, is really heartwarming. I've said a lot of times on the podcast that Shalon is one of my favorite Stormlight characters, but not in the way of Kings. I don't think she gets very good page time, if you will, in the way of Kings and I don't really enjoy her character that much, but this is the character arc. This is the character development that really uh, attracts me to Shalon as a character. And she is trying her best to keep her family together through all of what's, through all of what's happened, all of what's happening. So. So what I liked what I was most excited for whenever I started this chapter was it's kind of reminiscent reminiscent of Kaladin's flashback chapters, but this is more of a Shalon version. So we've had Shalon flashback chapters, but like I said, they're dark and kind of mysterious and short. It's like 
a few pages and and then you're done and you're like whoa what was that what's happening uh, but this was just kind of a story um of a of a major event in her past it was way more straightforward um and way more like telling of things going on and personalities and things like that which i kind of liked i, I was just kind of looking forward to one of these um even though i actually really like the style choice i guess of these like short glimpse flashbacks um I do like seeing how much it, it really does portray Shalon as like the only n- normal one. Her and maybe Helloran, what yeah. we've seen of him. Um, only like a normal member of her family, which still doesn't sit right with me, if I'm being honest. I don't know. I feel like either she has to have something that we just haven't seen completely, or or I don't know. It seems weird that she'd be the only one that's like <laughs> sane um but yeah frantically running around doing stuff um yeah I, I really enjoyed this chapter though there was a whole lot of stuff which we're gonna get into more of here coming up um let me just kind of let me stop you there early... for a second there's i it's probably like a paragraph where She's just finished meeting with Balat and in this chapter, and she thinks of her mother for a second and freezes. And then she has no idea how long she's been sitting there, and one of her uh, one of her house guards walks up and says, "Shalon, are you okay? Like you like she he just finds her in a corner just standing there. So I would hesitate to say that. Shalon is the only normal one because there's certainly something there that is not that that, that is not healthy in Shalon's head. She's just the narrator, so we don't like have all the pieces because we're seeing Balat and Wakim and Jushu from an external perspective. They're not the point of view. Shalon is the point of view, and there's certainly something that's being alluded to there that's weird, but we don't know what it is. So. Just, just hold the hold the Shalon is the only normal one because <laughs> that that's fair. That's fair. I guess my thought with that was the I feel like the worst I guess habit or thing that we see happen with Shalon is like an internal like thought or worry, which seems normal. You know, that's like a normal thing. But I guess we're not saying from the external perspective how that could be affecting her or affecting other people or things like that. Um, with the others, it's a very obvious, it's like a physical, like, Balot's torturing of animals is very obviously disturbing, um, and yeah. there's problems with gambling and all sorts of stuff and everything. So in that sense, Shalon has definitely been shown as the normal one, but you're right, you're right. I will kind of slow that thought down a little bit, um. Because it is from her perspective. All right, we've been dancing around a little bit, but uh, who's in this chapter, Elliot? And Paul, did you pick it up? So I did not get this on my first read, but the second time through as I was taking my notes, it dawned on me that this messenger here talking talking with first shalon's father and then with shalon herself can be no other than our our famous wit or or hoid and the the description of him that's given here matches pretty much word for word the very first description we get from wit in in way of kings that he's described as you know deep black hair black clothing blue eyes slender build even just the way he talks should have should have kind of been a clue, I think, to me that the first time that this that this has to be wit. I'm I'm ninety five percent sure that it is. I didn't I didn't realize that this is wit until, like I said, my fourth read of the book after I'd read Oathbringer, <laughs> after I had read The Way of Kings a couple times, and I came back to this scene. I was like wait 
I <laughs> I didn't even realize, but yes, this is this is wit. I did not pick it up until y'all were like, "We've seen this character before," and I was like, <laughs> "I think I was wit." Yeah, that. So I I didn't I didn't pick that up on my read through on my own, uh, but it does make perfect sense with the questions asked and things like that. It makes perfect sense that that would be wit. Um, there's a couple different and- there's a couple different actions that wit takes in this in this chapter that are very strange. He turn when when he first sees her, he does this huge double take, and says, "I was not like expecting he her. right. I was not expecting to see you here." And you're like, "What? Like, <laughs> does he does he recognize her? Does has he seen her before? Does he know who she is? What 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 is happening here?" And then the story, he he talks with with her about. The conversation. I'll have a quote here in a little bit, but I'll let Elliot talk a little bit about this because I I can tell he wants to uh, wants to talk about this a bit. So, Elliot, take it away. Yeah, yeah. I, as soon as I realize that this is is Hoyd, yeah, all the questions start to arise because, like you said, he he seems to recognize Shalon. Why? How? How in the world would he recognize Shalon? Or is it like he can immediately pick up on her surge binding ability? Because end of it, he talks like specifically about illumination and surge binding and how he, he even almost talks like he's done that kind of surge binding. He's like, Oh yeah, that was hard for me when I first started, but, but you'll get the hang of it kind of thing. I I'm paraphrasing. So it may not be that direct, but that's the impression you get, which, as if we didn't have enough questions about Hoyd, now we have more questions about Hoyd. Is he a surge binder? Is he a spren? Yeah, like what? What is he? And that's just the start of the the questions. There, there's even a few other like confusing things that he does in here. But I, I guess I kind of left this, Trevor. I'm I'm not surprised at all to hear that this is your favorite chapter of of Words of Radiance because this feels to me like perhaps the the wander sale moment for Shalon where Hoyd had his conversation with Kaladin out on the shattered plains and tells a story and and kind of plants that seed of inspiration if will, in Kaladin is this the moment when he does that for Shalon kind of you know blowing the ember if you will to kind of make it become a fire and kind of ignite her abilities if you will it feels like this might be the moment so i'll go ahead and read a quote this is after they have a brief parable if you will about beauty and can beauty be taken from a man and the the i won't read that part of it but he he tries to apply it to shalon and i will uh i'll read some of it here. Uh, this is Hoyt talking to start. What is it, child? Beauty to you. Mother still lives, she found herself whispering, meeting his eyes. And we're in the gardens. She is speaking to father, and he is laughing, laughing and holding her. We are all there, including Helleran. He never left. The people my mother knew, Drader, never came to our home. Mother loves me. She teaches me philosophy and shows me how to draw. Good, the messenger said, but you can do better than that. What is that place? What does it feel like? It's spring, Shalon shot back, growing annoyed, and the moss vines bloom in vigorous red. They smell sweet, and the air is moist from the morning's high storm. Mother whispers, but there's much to hear. There's music to her tone, and father's laugh doesn't echo. It rises high into the air, bathing us all. Helleran is teaching Jushu swords, and they spar nearby. Wakim laughs as Helleran is struck on the side of the leg. He is studying to be an ardent as mother wanted. I am sketching them all, charcoal scratching paper. I feel warm, despite the slight chill in the, to the air. I have a steaming cup of cider beside me, and I taste the sweetness in my mouth from the sip I just took. It is beautiful because it could have been. It should have been. She blinked tears. She saw it. Stormfather, but she saw it. She heard her mother's voice. Saw Chushu giving up spheres to blot as he lost the duel, but laughing as he paid uncaring of the loss
as Hoyd is provoking that story from her, he holds out spheres in front of her, and she sucks in the stormlight, and like the space between them starts glowing. And Shalon doesn't really realize it at the time, but the reason why she's seeing this is because she's light weaving it in front of her as she's saying it. And Hoyt is kind of egging her on to this, making sure that he's he's affirming to himself that she is who he thought, who he thinks she is. She's he's making sure that she can she can surge by and he's talking to the right person. But he's he's trying to get her to think about beauty in her own life and what that could look like. And it's a really cool, really cool image for for Shalon, especially young Shalon, who's gone through all this trauma and is trying to make things work. Um, but as the scene goes, she looks over at Wakim, who's in the carriage. He he didn't have he he didn't even have the energy to get out of the carriage and enjoy Middlefest. He's sitting there in the carriage probably because he was forced to come down from the manor to to this festival and he's just waiting to go back up. He also Wakim also mentions before this scene that he probably won't live long enough to see all of them be happy. So why should Shalon try? And it's really dark. Like we we it comes back up in uh chapter 48 but at this point wakim has blackbane on him like on his person so the fact that shallan looks back over to him and he's smiling trying to figure out these math problems that she uh put into glyphs for him this whole scene is so so cool that hoid's right here and apparently he wasn't intending to meet her here but he still takes advantage of the situation and tries to have her see beauty, which I think is a really cool chapter. I I love I love how encouraging this is. Even though he's even though he's maybe like forcing Shalon to like go through something a little bit painful and that she's imagining this beautiful scene, but she's imagining what should have been and not what isn't. And he's kind of teaching her about how, even though you're in a terrible situation, you can still find the the beauty there. And he even kind of, you know, after going through this story about, you know, can you take beauty away? They end on, you know, well, if a person is in such a terrible place, what does beauty look like to them? And Shalon's answer back to him is, you know, those moments when there's less pain. Mm-hmm. And and Hoyd kind of is, is like, yes, that's it right there. Do not despair. Do not end the hunt because thorns grow in your way giving her that little nugget to kind of hold on to that encouragement of you know don't don't stop cutting the the thorns down keep keep fighting and you can find the beauty like that's exactly what this poor traumatized shallan needs to hear at this uh, at this point here I did really like this. Whenever this chapter started, I was not expecting it to become such like a a deep topic, I guess. Right. I, I really liked that. I guess the sentiment of no matter what you've experienced, you have experienced beauty in some sense and that that is relative. Um, like he gives the example to Shalon, like what if someone only ever felt pain in their whole like that's all they ever did. And, you know, beauty to that person would be the days that they felt less pain than others, you know? Um, and I don't know. I thought that was a great sentiment, you know? It was a good chapter. Mm-hmm. I want to jump to 48 and talk about her other flashback chapter that we had in this episode. Because this one... If that one is bittersweet, this one's also bittersweet, but it's really like bitter and a little sweet. <laughs> like <laughs> there's <laughs> that there's some dark topics being talked about in this one. There's these basically slave traders 
who show up at the at the door to uh the Devar Manor and they have Jushu like chained to the back of this wagon and they show up to Shalon's dad and say he promised us that you would pay his tab because he's I don't remember how how many spheres he is in debt or whatever and her her dad is no sympathy for him he says you can have him i'm not i i wash my hands of him and it's shallan and balat mostly shallan but balat does give up his dagger to uh to save jushu and th- this is really the chapter that highlights how how much shallan is keeping the house together that she is quite literally keeping Wakim alive, giving him the motivation to keep living, and then keeping Jushu out of slavery to pay his his gambling uh, addiction. And she basically begs these guys to let him free, even though it's only half of what uh, what Jushu owes. So she's the youngest of her family, and she's doing all of the all of the work to keep the family together. It is. Yeah, I... It was kind of a touching moment where she kind of tried to round up her siblings to to get Jushu out of that mess. Um, they kind of all like offered to give something. Well, not all of them, but you know, Bilal gives up his dagger, and she's ready to give up her necklace and stuff, which both have high value and things like that. But yeah, it was touching. It, it really was. This was a really powerful chapter be, because of that, because Shalon pulls them together and it really is building that bond between, you know, all of them to, to where the point where they're willing to sacrifice for, to save their brother, even though he doesn't deserve it. You know, I, I think right. Lord Devar and Balad, I think even says this too, like they told Jushu this was going to happen. They warned him, Hey man, you got to stop doing this or it's not going to end you know, well, well, it didn't end well. And he had every chance to turn it around himself and just this. Yeah, he probably does. But, but Shalon saves him anyway. And that's really, that's really powerful. And I really, I really love that. But like you said, Trevor, the, the bitter is a little more powerful in this chapter than the sweet, because it doesn't end on that. It doesn't end on, and Shalon saved the day. They they rescued Jushu, even when he didn't deserve to be. It ends on their father basically going into a rage because of all this and saying, you know, things are going to change. I'm sick of this. Right. Like, e- yikes. He beats some of the serving staff outside of Shalon's room and then storms uh-huh. into her room. Doesn't doesn't beat Shalon, but that doesn't make it you know any better. <laughs> He's beating the dark eyes. So it's you know, it Shalon's able to you know, she's been able to build up her brothers and gotten them to a much better place, but it seems like their father is slipping further into into darkness. So this this section specifically is easily what has angered me more than any other thing we've read throughout these books. Um because of the way it's presented. So Shalon's dad gets mad at her earlier in the chapter, you know, kind of loses his temper. He doesn't harm her, but he yells at her and stuff like that. And then at the end, he prevent he presents this as his solution. He's like, I'm sorry, Shalon. Like, I've I would know you know I would never hurt you. Um I just need like what was it? an outlet for my anger and he beat a servant like to a pulp yeah and was and basically presented this to Shalon that like i hope no one else has has to get hurt like because of your mistakes uh, and that on it really boiled my blood like it really did it was like you can forget the <laughs> the bridge runs with Sadius and stuff. This is what's like upset me the most was that moment. Yeah. I am not a fan of Shalon's dad. 
he he makes my skin crawl more than any any other character in these books so far for sure i'm even a little more upset because i had a little bit of faith that something would happen from that shallan is i mean they're kind of fed up with him and they're like stop being mean to your kids you know like (laughs) wake up um and i was hoping for that to happen i just feel like he's too far gone like he's too mad he's too insane and manipulative and stuff so i'm a little i'm a little upset i'm a little sad for him yeah any other thoughts on these flashback chapters before we move on to something a little bit lighter in her <laughs> present day chapters those are my main thoughts nothing else all righty chapter 47 we have shalana and pattern talking back and forth in shalana's rooms and pattern starts decoding i guess you could say the the dawn chant any any thoughts on on this <laughs> there's this dead language that maybe Navani and Dalinar are just trying to figure out with the the visions but just based on like derivative languages he's able to figure out some lines of the dawn chant so what is it, patterns really gifted at words as we said last week <laughs> i was going to say this is pairing right off of what we said last week in that i guess it's a different perspective <laughs> He's like, oh, it was easy, and Shalon's like, easy enough that no scholar ever has ever been able to right. to figure it out at all, <laughs> um, and stuff, which which is kind of crazy. Yeah, I, I thought it was really cool. I thought that whenever they started talking about Dawn Chant, that she was going to somehow learn that Dalinar could read it or speak it or all that stuff. Um, I wasn't expecting pattern to just kind of be like oh yeah don't chant like (laughs) cool (laughs) it it's almost like we're getting to the point where navani and dalinar on one side and shallan and pattern and used to be yasna on the other side it's like they all have half of the puzzle if they would just get together they'd have and be honest with each other yeah (laughs) if they would just be open and, and work together they they'd have like all the answers if if Shalon and Pattern could both you know open up and share with Dalinar and Navani who could share what they know with Dalinar's visions and all of that. Ever they might they might be able to understand what's going on, but just kind of the way things are playing out, it seems like that's pretty far away from from happening. Yeah, I feel like it's it'd be. An- awkward conversation to try and get to that point where they're sharing these details like yeah so i was just uh reading don chant the other day and i uh <laughs> stumbled across this stuff that you might think was cool <laughs> delinar comes up and is like oh yeah i was just having a uh, a crazy dream last night you know <laughs> like <laughs> I, I feel like this conversation like it's kind of yep. hard to get to those conversations i guess especially with the the dynamic going on at the moment with with everyone there. But yeah, I would love for that to happen. Them all collaborating. Shalon's trying to find your theory. Do you guys have any theories about... She mentions Oathgates and the Shattered Plains, and she has a bunch of maps that all put your theory in different places. And do you guys have any theories about about what's happening here? So the the theory, if you want to call it that, that that I have is, is kind of the one that Shalon is is hid, it seems. The fact that she has all these maps and they're all they've all been created by different nations, right? And all of these nations place your theory in a different place notably not within their own borders, but nearby. That plus kind of the little nugget is about, you know, oath gates or instantaneous travel, you know, teleportation or something like this. All of that seems, does seem to fit with some sort of, some sort of answer where 
maybe a lot of people have been to Urethiru, but n not by roads, right? So they know what Urethiru looks like. They know that it's you know in mountains or hills, and they've they've been there, but they can't tell you where it is because they didn't travel there through a you know traditional method. And so it's natural they would say, oh yeah, Urethiru is just over there somewhere, but not really know where it is. So all of that would make sense, but instantaneous travel and gates and teleportation like that that all seems pretty crazy we haven't seen anything like that as far as i know in the rest of our books we've read there hasn't been any mention of it in the way of kings or words radiance or anything like that so i this did actually oath gates rung a bell with me a little bit so i did actually go back and search in um in way of kings for oath gates and it is actually mentioned in an epigraph this note from yasna's notes about oath gates and is one of the epigraphs in way of kings but as we were talking about earlier maybe it was last episode the, the the epigraphs in way of kings are so out of context they don't mean anything and so it was one of those where you passed over it like that means absolutely nothing to me and so this is now we get a little bit of context for what that note means, but we still don't even know what these these are. Perhaps I guess you could go out on, on, on a limb and say maybe there's an oath gate in the Shattered Plains. Maybe this is like a, a there's like a portal hidden somewhere where you can use it to travel to Urethiru, wherever Urethiru is. Like that can be a potential scenario here, I guess. Shalon mentions Noadon. Actually, hey, Noadon sighting. Actually, Pattern mentions Noadon first. I I did I did get excited when I saw Noadon or his his other name, but Bajerdin is that how you say it? It's like a J ja sound. Bajerdin is how they say it. Bajerdin. I. Side note: they they said Bajerdin this time, but before it was Bajerdin unimportant i don't know which one it is but <laughs> i'm pretty but sure your or whatever Aridin. but yeah anyway that guy i got excited because anytime no on comes up i i get excited but we saw another mention of him in the in the dawn chant there or in relation to your theory although i didn't quite it, it's a name right like patterns reading the name off the map so yeah I feel like I don't have a complete grasp on how important Noadon is. At first, I feel like he's revered as like one of the greatest people in history in Valethkar and stuff like that with Dalinar in the Way of Kings. And then as the flashback chapters happen, it seems like they kind of lower him a few rungs. Like he didn't really know what was going on at the time. Maybe he had some great revelation later in life or something and a good thinker, but I don't know. But now all this correlation to your theory and stuff like that makes me think he's way up again. I don't know. He's kind of been a polar character in my mind as far as how important he is, how strong he was or smart, things like that. Sure. Don't quite know what to make of him, but I mean, I'm a big fan, but he's interesting. It kind of makes me chuckle that you guys wouldn't really be giving Noah on a second thought if not for the title of our <laughs> not for the title of our podcast. Noah on, cool. Next, <laughs> right? <laughs> but hey, yeah, we're following this dude, so I want to yeah. learn all about him. Maybe Trevor's just been messing with us this whole time, and it's like a red herring. <laughs> Ooh, what's Noah? Where's Noah on really going to come into play here? And it's just. <laughs> He was just some old king, like not really that big of a deal. <laughs> like, if we let me go down this plane trail for a second, if we have any context of who's the person that's closest to us and following Noah on, who would that be? Dalinar. 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 Which one's Dalinar's book? Oathbringer. Oathbringer. Okay. So. When did we start the podcast? 
March? Question mark. June. June. Really? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, our first recording was May, but it didn't go live till June. Okay. But at at that point, that was the most recent uh, Stormlight book. So that's uh, anyway. all the hints. There you go. Shalon at the end of this chapter is on her way to go meet Adolin, um, which in chapter forty eight nine is the date with Adolin. But um, there's a there's a little side piece here in 47 where she's in her carriage and she creates this illusion in front of her of Sabariel and it's she says it's extremely detailed but doesn't move so um this is kind of something we haven't really seen before of her creating a full lifelike image in front of her as opposed to on herself We've seen her do it, like, to hide her face or to change her hair or something like that. But we haven't seen her create an image this realistic in front of her yet. So this is kind of something new, I guess you could say. She's definitely getting better. She's definitely getting quite a bit better at it as she as she goes. She's developing more abilities and more refined ways that she can do this. She still has to draw, though, which again, is still the kind of interesting point for me in that she she can't do it unless she draws a picture of it first. Yeah, she's leveling up, if you will. Sure. And then we jump to chapter 49, where she's on a date with Adolin in this, uh, this balcony. And Paul, earlier in the Discord, you said you were very opinionated about this uh this chapter so i'll ask you about that here in a second but just for a little bit of context since we've been jumping back and forth this is right after chapter 48 and chapter 48 like we said about 20 minutes ago is very dark and very somber of her her dad being very evil dare i say with that word yeah and then we jump into this this chapter of Shalon and Adolin talking about date things and kind of flirting with each other the entire chapter. What it... Oh, more than kind of. <laughs> so, so Paul, I'll guess... let you, I'll let you lead here. What are your, what are your thoughts here? So I have some complaints about this chapter and it's not the premise of the chapter, but the contents, <laughs> Okay. Um, it got, I feel like it got a little bit out of hand, in my honest opinion. <laughs> um, so I, I thought, I, I was actually really looking forward to this chapter, seeing just Adolin and Shalon talking, getting to know each other, hopefully hitting it off. Um, and they definitely did hit it off. Um, it was good. It was kind of like genuine conversation. Right. Right. Well, uh, the first half wasn't, but the second half, Shalon yes, felt like yeah, it went first, a lot better. Yeah, because they talk about things that you don't just casually... It's not the like entry-level questions, you know, not your top stories, things like that. And I liked the idea of having Shalon, you know, ask different questions. I just didn't like the questions she asked. I'll be honest. I I feel like it wasn't. You, you don't talk about poop on your dates. Yeah, not not typically. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. It was okay. <laughs> it was. <laughs> like I said, I. I feel like it should have gone a different. Like, come up with anything else, in my <laughs> personal opinion. I wasn't a fan of the the poop conversation. I, I did I, like I, I got to say, I had, a, I had a slightly different thought along the same lines, though, of, of what you're talking about there. I just couldn't help but, like, try and picture this scene movie or, you know, some sort of, of did too. visual depiction. And my... My thought on that was whoever the actress is that's playing has a really challenging job here 
for multiple reasons. One, Shalon has to be like poised and calm on the outside, but having this massive struggle on the inside to, you know, keep her composure. And also she's being distracted by this beautiful man that's, that's sitting across the table from her. And then balancing all of this with just these ridiculous outbursts that, that Shalon is now getting you know known for of just not having these filter, like being able to pull all of that off in like a genuine, believable way. I think that would be really challenging. I would be, that actress would have to do a really good job of, of portraying that in that, that manner. That would be like, you read it and your imagination can kind of fill in some of the blanks there to make it believable, but that could be really not a great, not a very believable character if it wasn't acted well. Sure. It would seem like a satire or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I also, I feel like we're almost too quickly running away from original Shalon. This whole, this book specifically, but everything up until now has shown Shalon develop past her polite proper self into a more realistic, you know, strong, uh, confident woman. And I don't know. I I can't picture Shalon saying these things at all. (laughs) And, I don't know. I I felt like it just. I felt like you could you could have portrayed the same effect of having this unique, ridiculous conversation, you know, in a in a different way. That's my complaint with this with this chapter. This is this is no filter wisecrack, Shalon, from right. that mm-hmm. her that her brothers would egg on for her to. Okay, you're thinking of a joke. What is it? Or or the sailors that we've seen at the beginning of The Way of Kings and the beginning of Words of Radiance, where they're like, oh, come on, where's the crude joke? We know you're thinking of it. Just give it to us. So <laughs> that that's the Shalon we're seeing here. I I think my, my takeaways are my thoughts coming out flirting scene between Shalon and Adolin is one, Adolin puts kind of Shalon off her guard. Like he, he causes her to be a little more open and honest than maybe she, she would be right. She's trying to leverage the, the tin and the Yasna sides of her to manipulate Adolin into getting what she needs, but then also just kind of being that confident and, you know, equal to Adolin that she wants to be so she can move forward with this. But Adolin like kind of brings out in her, part of her actual self which is this you know cheeky girl who has all the you know crude jokes or whatever that she brings out and and no filter and all this so in in the end you get this kind of weird mix of all of them you get the i'm kind of manipulative but i'm kind of just you know trying to help you and be logical but at the same time i'm goofy and quirky and rather quite strange at the same time and all of that being said Adolin likes her. Like after all of that, Adolin still leaves the whole conversation enamored. It, we like so it, it works, I guess. Yeah. My favorite, one one of my favorite Shalon lines is in this chapter, where Adolin mentions the high storm of, of why they're on the balcony, and she like gets all pale. And Adolin says, "Oh, you're you're really pale. Are are you okay?" And she's like, "No, it, it's natural." And he he comes back with, "Oh, because you're Vaden." And she says, "No, because I'm always on the edge of panic these days." Oh, is that our wine? <laughs> and just doesn't <laughs> doesn't do it. But that that's one of my favorite uh, that shal- is, shal- shal- lines. Really <laughs> that is great. It it's an entertaining sequence for sure. There are a couple. I, there's a couple plot pushes in this scene. Not a lot. Most of it's just casual flirtations. But we talk about chasm fiends. We talk about void bringers, sort of. In um, Shalon brings it up to to Adolin. Adolin kind of brushes it off. I feel like there's one more, but I'm not remembering it at the moment. 
Well, she's kind of inexplicably mesmerized by the high storm. I don't know if that's a plot point or not, but it's certainly of interest. What I was trying to think of was Adolin confiding in Chalon. Oh, yes. The, the uh, Dalinar's plan. Let's mm-hmm. let's talk about that one first, actually. So that one, I, I noted that in my, my notes here. Not only is Adolin kind of putting Shalon off her guard, Shalon is doing the same thing to Adolin because he spills all the beans. Yeah, he like does. He tells her the whole plan, which we know Shalon, we know that's probably fine. But if Adolin had done that to anyone else, we'd be like, whoa, dude, what are you, what are you doing? That's the whole secret plan. Why are you telling this to the girl you met? A week ago, you know, a few days ago, I, I don't think that was smart of Adolin, but I think it'll be fine because we we know Shalon's a, a good guy. No, Shalon's our biggest villain from the Way of Kings. Don't you remember? Oh, that that's was, right. Yeah. So even above it, Sadius, don't don't just because she's being nice now. Okay, don't let that fool you. Okay, don't let this distract so, you from the fact she stole a soul caster. She did it intentionally. Okay. <laughs> go, go watch what? our uh, Way of Kings episodes if that made absolutely no sense to you, yeah. viewers and, and listeners. I did rescind my statement. <laughs> Point. Before we had some major Sadius information, I viewed Shalon as one of the biggest villains of, of our stories. Anyways, um, one thing I wanted to say about these chapters, there were some... This is both good and bad in my mind. Um, So one thing I liked was Shalon kind of poses ideas and ways that her and Adolin can work together that would really help her a lot. And we get to see a lot of interesting stuff, like her going to see the chrysalises and stuff like that um, out on the Shattered Plains. Briefly went over that. One thing I wanted to say about that, I guess... So I think that's awesome, and I'm curious to see how Adolin can almost be a resource to Shalon and vice versa. Um, but the way it was set up, I'm almost a little afraid that I'll spend too much time on that, specifically with the... Shalon presented this idea of like breeding chasm fiends, which I thought was kind of cool, honestly. Yeah. But I hope... I kind of hope going forward that's not fleshed out too much because I feel like that's not a it'd be a great economic thing for for uh you can you can say boring it's okay yeah it, it would be a good thing but that's not the plot point that I'm interested in you right know? um I think the only purpose it could really serve that's valuable in our character dynamic sense is presenting this to Dalinar or something and it's a great idea builds rapport things like that um but yeah I kind of don't want to see that fleshed out too much because then I feel like we're getting into Wave King Shalon chapters where it's more just just world building sure. in a sense so it it seems like she's just lying to to get Adolin to take her out onto the the shattered plains. I I'll be a little surprised if that yeah fleshes out into something larger than that. I think she's just trying. She's looking for an excuse to get out there and explore. I think so too. She had to present her reason of oh, this would be right. a good, you know this that's is her cover initial idea. But yeah, I, I don't I don't expect to see that fleshed out. And if it really does some for some reason, I would be a little disappointed. But that's just my my thoughts. Um. Yeah, I'm curious to hear if y'all have any notable thoughts on the very end of the chapter with the um, high storm. We say that all the time, and I almost forgot what it was. <laughs> um, our high storm and Shalon kind of being crazy about it, almost. Uh, maybe this is a little bit of what Trevor was alluding to earlier with her kind of freezing kind of stuck in thought almost and how that is kind of abnormal that's a little a little weird at least um that she kind of gets stuck out there um it almost seems obsessive in the moment she wants to draw it and it seems like an obsessive like compulsive thing um 
but yeah, I don't know if really there's much to look into it with that. It oh, it definitely okay. seemed it seemed of note to me. It struck me as a little bit fishy. It was almost like she's mesmerized by because I, I think Adolin even remarks on this in the in the chapter. Not not five minutes ago, she was like terrified by the idea of the high storm being there. And then, you know, she's all worried that it's coming and wants to go hide. And then all of a sudden, as soon as she sees it, she's to the railing and can't even, you know, tear herself away. Like that's an unhealthy yeah obsession with with something that's about to kill you and and you get that that final scene where they you know adolin finally drags her away they rush into the the safe house and shallan's like counting the sec and she's like oh we had six whole more seconds we could have been out there like shallan what what are you talking about here girl are you are you gone crazy like i I don't know if this is just like another weird shallan quirk or if there's maybe a little something more to this like is she because she's a surge binder, does she feel like drawn to the storm somehow? She she talks about how she's like, it looks like there's something in the storm. And I kind of took that as more of like a metaphor that the storm is like a, a living thing, but she's but an artist. Maybe, Take it for, with a grain of salt. Right. Sure. Exactly. Right. But at, at the same time, like, I don't know, we, we've heard storm spren or, or void spren kind of tossed around before. Maybe there is something in the storm, like, calling to her because she has the ability she she does maybe it is more magical if you will than than just another quirky shallan thing i would definitely consider it at least a red flag yeah Um, (laughs) uh yeah i thought i thought it was interesting my honest to be honest the only reason i thought about this a lot was because it was at the very end of the chapter, right. especially coming up to the end of our reading, I always kind of expect a bigger reveal or event or something like that. Um, because Trevor does a great job pacing our chapters. I'll be honest. I try. Um, oh yeah. But I was kind of expecting something. And I, I thought about this as like an episode of like a show or something. This storm comes, she's glued to it. Adeline kind of grabs her. They run inside and you're kind of left wondering, like, like what, what was she doing? Like, what was she doing? This is something like kind of weird going on. Um, so I, I'm thinking that this is bigger than it seems. Um, either one being, like Elliot said, there's something in the storm that's kind of luring her in a sense, yeah. or there's something more abnormal. Almost like Trevor said earlier, like maybe she's a little more crazy than we've seen um, with stuff like this or in some ways. So I feel like there's more, more to it. That's a good, that's an interesting comparison to compare this moment to like the trances that we've seen her go into in her, in her flashback chapters where she kind of freezes and then, you know, time passes and she doesn't even realize like what's going on. Is this maybe like a resurgence of something like that, where the high storm like is causing her to freeze up like this in that sense? That's that's an interesting thought. Hmm. I'm curious to see if this will happen again, if we'll get another chance to see Shalon witness a, a high storm and see how she reacts. What if she gets strung up like Kaladin? Oh man. <laughs> That would come to <laughs> but just what if you know? What would Shalon have to do to get strung up in a high storm? Get caught. Oh, sneaking around I don't Amram. know. Yeah, get caught sneaking into Amram's place. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That would be quite the turn of events. That would be quite the turn of events. Because they think she's a dark eyes, because she's camouflaged in a dark eyes, so they. String her, string her up because she's yeah, like sneaking right around, go. sneaking around Amram's quarters, and she turns the high, high st- the whole high storm into some big illusion or something, and ooh, <laughs> you know, crazy. All righty, any any closing thoughts for episode thirty six? We are well into part three of Words of Radiance. Oh yeah, we're we're moving now. I I think I'm most like dreading and excited to read more of 
Adolin and Shallan the most. Like this, this chapter we we just talked about was was a little weird. It was a little off, but at the same time, like now I'm really intrigued to see where their relationship goes. We we know that that Adolin has a pretty rocky history with keeping relationships going. So is he gonna is he gonna tank it with Shallan, or is Shallan gonna gonna ruin it for the two of them here coming up, or are they gonna be able to? To hold it together and are they actually like gonna go forward and, and get married is that something we're gonna see here in in words of radiance I, I think i'm most curious for that plot thread right now I, I don't have any more major thoughts about our reading so far um going forward i'm really curious to see where it goes because i feel like we've been introduced to several plot point ideas um and none of them have been fleshed out super far. And at our current state right now, I'm not super thrilled with this just because, I don't know, I, I, I was way more interested in the, oh, what's going to happen when Shalon arrives? Oh, what's going to happen when Zeth comes? That stuff. And I feel like all that's kind of not really... Uh, Re relevant anymore so I think I'm more invested actually in Kaladin's side of things with learning to fight a shard bear and, and things like that and at Amaram the moment. and stuff mm -hmm. yeah for sure so that's what I'm looking forward to going forward right now cool well we can call it here and reconvene next week thank you for joining me Elliot and Paul adios Hasta luego.